coming up next on We Are Marshall Today, celebrating 50 years as a university. We'll take you to the state capitol for a green and white anniversary. Plus, fighting the drug war <coughs> right on the home front. We'll have details coming up next on We Are Marshall Today. Hello and welcome to We Are Marshall Today. I'm Leah Clark Payne. And I'm Dan Hollis. The war to reduce drug abuse in the United States is moving a little closer to home. That's right, Dan. Statistics show that prescription drug abuse is on the rise and efforts are underway to figure out how to stop it. Efforts that include Marshall University. U.S. Senator Jay Rockefeller and National Drug Control Director Gil Kurlikowski both agree the abuse of prescription drugs is a serious issue for families across the nation, but particularly in Appalachia. The two met with local officials in late February on Marshall's Huntington campus. The meeting was part of Kurlikowski's tour of West Virginia and Kentucky for a first-hand look at the issue. This is a great opportunity. The coalition meeting we had earlier uh, uh, was terrific. The people are really doing a great job. But now I think the specialty of addressing what's unique about college campuses and college students and how to deal with the drug problem there is important. Kurlikowski, a former police chief in Seattle, believes prescription drug abuse on college campuses is a significant threat. It's a problem for a lot of reasons. Young people are exposed to a lot of prescription drugs. They often don't recognize that those drugs can be dangerous and addictive. And we've seen some real tragedies, but here at Marshall, they're working hard to address it. Rockefeller is reintroducing federal legislation in the coming weeks that he believes will help prevent the unsafe use of prescription drugs, which he characterizes as a devastating issue. This is a problem which is a sweeping Appalachia, sweeping the nation. It is terrifying. Um, you know, it's, it's not unfair to compare it in sort of its startling, sudden nature um, to the great influenza epidemic of 1918. It ruins lives. The Mountain State has the nation's highest rate of overdose deaths, with most of those involving prescription drugs. Joining us now is Michelle Burnside, who is with the West Virginia Prevention Resource Center. Michelle, thank you for being here today. Thanks for having us on the show. You're welcome. To give us a brief overview of what your organization does. Well, the Prevention Resource Center has been around for a little over a decade, and we are an affiliate of Marshall. Um, through various federal grant funding, we've done a variety of projects over the years. Primarily, they have been efforts to help community coalition groups with substance abuse prevention efforts. So we've been doing trainings, workshops, conferences, a lot of one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, and that's been on everything from how to assess problems in a community, how to gather data, um, how to put together strategic plans for addressing substance abuse and, and those types of things. Are you um, a federal agency or how do you how do you get your funding? We are federally funded and we are currently federally funded through a grant that comes through the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. Um, there's been a variety of different projects but the majority of them have been federal funding over the years. Um, we are oriented with Marshall. Mm -hmm. um, we are located in Dunbar, West Virginia and administratively housed with the Graduate College. Um, but we have primarily been working with um, community coalitions over the years, no. grassroots efforts. Throughout the state? Yes, throughout the state. We've had folks who have lived and worked in the various counties. Um, and right now, most folks are in Dunbar, but we still have a few field staff that primarily work on a regional and county basis. We just uh, ran a story about prescription drug abuse, and specifically in West Virginia. Uh, talk uh, about that a little bit and, and what the statistics are and uh, what's being done. Yes, unfortunately, West Virginia um, has an issue with prescription drug abuse, and that isn't necessarily unique to West Virginia. Just about every state is struggling with prescription drug abuse. Um, in West Virginia, um, one of the statistics that's interesting is that our per capita um, filling of prescriptions is almost 20 per person every year. And the national average is about 12. So we seem to have a real um, plentiful abundance of prescriptions floating around. Um, and that may possibly be one of the contributors to the um, abuse of prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. And the other statistics that is in contributing is that we know that from national statistics that most folks who are abusing or misusing prescription drugs, they are getting those from family and friends through sharing. They're not necessarily stealing them. That does happen. That's a 
small percentage, um, but most folks are getting them just for free from family and friends. So the sharing angle is a real issue in West Virginia um, with the prescription drug abuse. You all recently ran a campaign, and you're still running a campaign, about educating people yes. about prescription drug abuse. Um, do you think that that's part of the issue, is that they just are unaware that this is A, illegal, and B, a huge issue. Yes, in, in analyzing data over the years um, in prescription drug abuse, uh, that sharing data was certainly something that caught our attention. And when a particular pot of money um, became available to the, the Prevention Resource Center and another entity that we staff, the West Virginia Partnership to Promote Community Wellbeing, we wanted to do something that could impact the sharing as quickly as possible. Um, we know that social marketing, the marketing of causes rather than you know organization or a commercial product. Product, um, does work, um, but we didn't feel like we had the luxury of a whole generation like we've had for um, smoking and a lot of other issues that we're still battling. Um, so it was decided that a social marketing campaign needed to be developed pretty quickly. Um, we worked with a communications firm in West Virginia. Everything was research-based and tested and those types of things to make sure that it would be effective. And we put together a comprehensive social mar marketing package. It's not just public service announcements, but there were public service announcements, there were prescription bags that were given to pharmacies, there was a community forum component, and all of those things collectively were able to bring up awareness a little bit about prescription drug abuse sharing. And it, it all continues and it still needs to be done, but I can talk um, a little bit more depth about those um, items. The public service announcements, there were television, radio, and print spots. They're all available online at www.takecarewv.org. They can be viewed, they can be downloaded, and anyone out there in the state can use them in, in their capacity. For example, if you've got someone that works at a school and you have some type of television programming, you can easily run those television spots in your school at no cost. They're free to download. Um, the print pieces can easily be printed as flyers or if you have um, local media outlets or other vendors that would be willing to print them or put them into their publications, they can all also be downloaded and, and used. Um, and then the prescription bags, which um, were distributed. Yes, and you have one with you, yes, right? Back in 2010, we were able to print um, more than a million and a half of these and get them to just about every pharmacy in West Virginia. Um, we did this with the help of our county coalition partners. Um, they were instrumental in getting these distributed to local pharmacies, talking with pharmacists, making sure that they got out in the counties. And um, I'm, I'm proud to say that every county participated in some form and just about every um, pharmacy did take some and distribute them. So um, these materials, although the campaign was launched and um, primarily took place in the summer and fall of 2010, they are all resources that still exist that emphasize the message of not sharing because it is illegal, it is dangerous, and they are out there to be used by anyone, whether it's a media outlet or a county coalition, a doctor's office. Mm -hmm. They're resources for our state to use to continue to promote that message that it is illegal and dangerous to share. So another question, you mentioned that it's illegal to, yes. to share. So what are the ramifications? What are the um, the punishments? Well, there is federal law that makes sharing of prescription drugs illegal. It's important for folks to know that sharing is cons considered distribution of drugs. Um, if you have a prescription that is not um, prescribed to you by a doctor, then it is illegal. It is illegal to share that. And the fines can range from thousands of dollars um, to jail time that can range up to 20 years. So there are significant penalties. Um, of course, it's going to vary based on the exact schedule of the narcotic, um, the amount and those types of things. It's going to vary in the situation. But again, hefty fines and up to 20 years in prison. So it's, it's no small penalty whatsoever. Right. And I know we haven't even t talked about this, but aside from narcotic sharing, e even sharing antibiotics is an issue, but that's a whole other issue because of antibiotic resistance and, and different things like that. So Absolutely. Uh, speaking to prescription drugs, how should people dispose of their leftover medication? There are some common things that, that folks can keep in mind, and I will emphasize, of course, I'm not a pharmacist, so you want to check if you're unsure with your pharmacist or on the labeling with your prescription, but in most cases, the number one thing to remember is to not flush them down, the, the toilet or the sink. Um, that has been uh, mentioned in the past, and um, it's really not a good idea because it can get into the water stream. The basic thing to remember is to take it out of its original packaging, to mix it with something undesirable, 
marble, say kitty litter, um, coffee grinds, maybe put it in a plastic bag or an old margarine tub and then dispose of it separately from your prescription bottle. And you want to take your prescription bottle and mark out any personal information, identifying info, and just put that into the trash. So if you're just not tossing a bottle into the trash with, with pills left in it, um, it's going to be a lot safer to dispose that way. All right. Michelle Burnside, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having us on the show. You're welcome. And coming up next, Marshall celebrates 50 years as a university. Stay with us for details. As you think about your future, who's your competition? Who are your chief competitors? I notice some of you looking to your right and left at your neighbors. You need to think bigger, much bigger. Choose Marshall University. Big enough to matter, small enough to care. Immerse yourself in your learning. Connect with your professors and have fun learning. That's important too. Find your passion, pursue your dreams. Marshall University. Prescription drug abuse and misuse is a serious problem. Taking it appropriately, prescribed medication is just as dangerous and deadly as street drugs. So it's important for you to know it is illegal for you to share your medication or take medication prescribed to someone else. My name is Emily, and in seven years, I'll be an alcoholic. Hi, Emily. I'll start drinking in eighth grade, but my parents won't really notice because I'll do okay in school and everything will seem okay, but everything won't be okay. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults, so start talking before they start drinking. Graduating seniors entering the job market this spring didn't have far to go to meet some employers recently. Career Services at Marsh University sponsored its annual Spring Job Expo in March. Dozens of employers set up mobile displays in the Memorial Student Center for on-the-spot interviews. Career Services offers students many options to help them in the job search, including resume writing tips and mock interview sessions. Female researchers at Marshall University showcased some of their findings earlier this month during a special symposium. The event was sponsored by MU Advance which is an initiative funded by the National Science Foundation to increase recruitment and retention of female researchers in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This month's symposium was named in honor of Dr. Pat Logan, a Marshall researcher who passed away in December. They didn't see a battle overseas, but women who played a significant role on the home front during World War II recently visited Marshall for a presentation. The West Virginia Rosies, women who served as defense workers during the war, are part of a partnership educating people about World War II. Marshall School of Pharmacy has added two new faces to its growing list of staff. Dean Kevin Yingling announced earlier this month that Dr. Robert Stanton has been hired to oversee the school's professional experience program. Stanton will be responsible for establishing practice sites for students. Also named Director of Student Affairs and Assessment is Terry Moran. Moran will serve as the school's liaison with university units, outside organizations, and the general public. They are students, but not the ones you usually see on a college campus. These preschoolers attend class at Marshall's Early Education STEM Center, and on this particular day, they were on a field trip to Marshall's mail room. The children learned how mail is collected on campus and then delivered. Marshall's Early Education STEM Center is open to three and four year olds and is geared toward developing 21st century skills in the students to prepare them for success. Very cool. And now on to another program at Marshall University that prepares students for success. Today we introduce you to Marshall's Executive MBA program. It's an accelerated Master of Business Administration degree for professionals who go to school on the weekends. As Mike Powers reports, it's certainly advantageous for returning students who are trying to juggle work, family, and school. Toyota motor manufacturing engineer Tom Johnson is busy Monday through Friday earning a living at the Buffalo, West Virginia engine plant. For years, he thought about returning to school for a business degree. But he wasn't sure how to combine work, school, and his time-consuming hobby of being a high school basketball referee. Marshall EMBA program is his solution. It's a weekend warrior type of education that allows him to merge his love of engineering with the nuts and bolts of business. We deal with very large project numbers, um, and I never really could capture what that actual dollar amount meant, except for I was spending it on equipment. Now, from the business side of it, I understand how that money is invested and how it's returned on investment by producing things off those machines in which we buy. Joining Johnson as colleagues in the current EMBA cohort are fellow engineers Evan Johnson and Anthony Redenauer. 
All three are complementary of the program, which allows them to earn an accredited MBA degree without interrupting their careers. Toyota Manager of Corporate Development, Kevin Fields, says Marshall University is a significant partner in the region's development of people and business. We are so fortunate to have a university like Marshall in our community. And when you look around at our, our plant, you look at every level, uh, from production members uh, to uh, quality, to accounting, to business office, uh, to our production engineering group, uh, you see uh, Marshall graduates contributing in very big ways. The EMBA program at Marshall is housed at the South Charleston campus and is currently enrolling for the next cohort, which begins in June. The 16-month curriculum includes business ethics, global leadership skills, and management tools for the 21st century. If you would like more information, visit us online at marshall.edu slash lcob. For We Are Marshall Today, I'm Mike Powers. And joining us now to talk more about the Executive MBA program is its director, Dr. Uday Tate. Dr. Tate, thanks for being here. Good morning. Thank uh, you very much. The program is really a recognition that people lead busy lives these days. Uh, how does the program work with individuals who have jobs, children, obligations? Uh, indeed. This is what they call compressed learning process in the sense that we have five or six Saturdays per course, but only on Saturdays. So there's a minimal interruption in their work, family, or personal life. So uh, the program is only up for about 15 to 16 months as compared to the traditional program which is about three years typically it takes. So um, without any interruption, they can continue with their career plans and yet get a, an accredited degree, which is the big, big difference between online degrees or some other degrees that they have in the region. But ours is a full-fledged MBA, uh, accelerated as we call it. And uh, that, has, that model has worked tremendously for us. What, what kind of courses will, what kind of things will they learn? We have a range of things, uh, soft versus hard skills. For example, we emphasize leadership skills, team building, also networking, uh, negotiation skills. Then comes the other side is quantitative skills, how to analyze data, how, how do you interpret the data. Also uh, reading financial statements, supply chain, designing of supply chain. So there are different kinds of skills, critical thinking for example. Uh, problem solving skills, writing, communications. Actually, we have professors from communications uh, studies who come and talk about written and oral communications. So there's, there's a range of skills that they need in the real world of business. And there are some other value-added uh, opportunities with this program too, aren't there? Indeed. Uh, one of them we have is, I, I would think it's a unique feature, and that is that language lab. We have, uh, for about six months, one of our professors teaches either Spanish or Portuguese. And Spanish, particularly in this country, is, is an essential language because we have a lot of Spanish-speaking employees. Plus, uh, half of the world speaks Spanish, so we teach them business Spanish. And alternatively, we may be switching to Portuguese. Uh, certainly, it would be nice to teach German if you go to Germany, but it's not that easy in those kinds of languages. China, Chinese would be another language you would like to have. But that's one uh, value-added feature. The second one is we conduct series of career planning sessions, workshops, for our um, professionals in the class because these are not first-time job hunting people. These are mid-level managers. They may want to switch the organization or uh, achieve some promotion in the organization. It's a different strategy than entry-level job. So that's the second thing. The, the third is value-added feature is the leadership workshops we conduct. These are done by ROTC, our own. The military people come and conduct obstacles, uh, leadership behaviors, enemy camp versus your own camp, and they actually go through the exercise, military exercise, for civilians, and it has worked tremendously. Uh, you talk about team building skills. Periodically we have guest speakers from corporate worlds. We have one of the best uh, known person in Six Sigma quality, uh, total quality management is Mr. Ed Painter from Walker Industry, black belt person. Mm. He comes and trains and talks about Six Sigma in our class. We had a gentleman from a local company that exports to China and Germany. They had a project on uh, outsourcing to India. 
we gave, we handed over to class. It was a hands-on experience. One of the uh, value-added feature is the immediate return on investment. Right. What they learn on a Saturday, they go, can go back and implement some of those skills and tools in the organization. Well, let's talk about how the program works. Uh, you, you find students, a cohort, Cohorts. then they come in all together and they all take the same classes? Exactly the same sequence. Nobody can get out of this uh, sequence because that is the key. Uh, as a cohort, they, they gel, they bond, they work together, they know each other. And what we do is we switch around the teams so that no one person is clicked into one particular team. They need to learn how to agree, disagree, uh, negotiate, etc. And so this is a sequence of certain courses they have to be taking. And uh, it's a cohort system has worked out uh, absolutely phenomenally good. And you, and you make sure that the cohort uh, represents? Diverse industries, yeah. uh, ranging from coal mining to uh, WV or West Virginia government. We have people from healthcare. We have people from Armstrong and Verizon kinds of companies. We have uh, manufacturing. Toyota, a Buffalo plant, has sent three engineers. So it's, it's a really diverse and group. And everybody benefits from everybody else. Everybody else because they have different experiences. And that's the key of this particular model we have, delivery model, or EMBA, or executive MBA, is that bringing in the classroom their learning experiences and then feeding off each other. That is phenomenally uh, rewarding, I would say. Well, let's switch topics just a little bit and talk about some upcoming uh, things going on in the Lewis College of Business. Yes, indeed. Uh, we have uh, on April, I believe, 26th, uh, we have what we call Lewis College of Business Hall of Fame. And the Dean of College of Business, Dr. Chang Kim, invites uh, area a top-notch alumni of our university who happen to be business leaders. For example, uh, the next Hall of Fame is going to be on April 26th. One of the inductees, if you will, is Mr. Brad Smith, who is the CEO of Intuit, one of the top uh, accounting software company. And so we invite these uh, leaders, business leaders, and honor them, induct them in our Hall of Fame. And that's, that's the um, event that's going to be happening on April 26th in alumni, New Alumni Center. And you have a couple other projects that are upcoming, right? Yes, indeed. We have open house information session for Executive MBA program on April 16th, that is Saturday, in South Charleston campus. And we will start from 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock with the refreshment. And at the open house, we have several faculty attend that. So if you have any questions about the particular course or topic, uh, we help them understand what are the requirements, uh, what are the sequencing of the courses, and we also talk about international trip. We also talk about domestic trip. That's another value-added feature we have. Not only international, but we also take our students, uh, given certain enrollment, take them out to uh, Charlotte, Columbus, things like that to understand American culture. Well, it, it just sounds like a great program. Thank uh, you very thanks much. Thanks for being here. Dr. Thank Tate. you very much for having me. Coming up next, uh, 50 years as a university, a celebration at the state capitol. Stay with us. It's easy to tell if you've had way too many. But what if you've had just one too many? There we go. Buzz driving is drunk driving. From the classroom straight to your computer. I teach international marketing online 100%. I conduct this class from my office, from my home, and it is 24-7 available to students across the country. I would say this has been one of the most challenging and rewarding experiences, not only for me, for my students as well. Nationally accredited, affordable, convenient, MU Online. Fifty years ago this month, Marshall College earned university status through legislation adopted by the legislature and then signed by the governor. Fast forward five decades and the halls of the West Virginia State Capitol are once again decked out in green and white. 
50th anniversary of Marshall becoming a uh, university, achieving university status. And uh, as I said in my remarks, uh, they have uh, not missed a beat since. They continue to grow, to prosper, to educate not only our uh, uh, students from West Virginia, but across the country and around the globe. So it's a, uh, I think it's one of the jewels in our higher education system, and they continue to improve and do better and turn out more college graduates each year. So I'm very proud of this anniversary for Marshall. When you look at uh, the status of, of any organization, it's a higher education organization, being a university uh, is the penultimate. It's the, it's the highest uh, uh, standing that an uh, organization dedicated to uh, higher learning can achieve. And uh, back in the 1960s and 50s, uh, it was very, very hard to earn that status. And uh, Marshall did in 1961, and uh, uh, the rest is history, as they say, in terms of the progress that's happened at Marshall University since then. A lot of it traced back to uh, the fact that we're, we're considered a university. It was the most exciting day. Actually, we didn't know what was happening until we knew that uh, Governor Barron was coming and we were going to become a university. So we went into Gullickson Hall and he signed the bill and afterward everybody went wild. And uh, we just had a glorious afternoon. I guess classes were canceled, I would assume. And we just were out celebrating thinking, here we are, Marshall University. Great story and a great milestone for Marshall University. Absolutely. Thanks for watching. I'm Leah Clark Payne. And I'm Dan Hollis. Thanks for watching. Bye. At Marshall University, you can get all the information and resources you need right at your fingertips. From schedules, to flexible courses, to friendly student resources. From the MyMU portal, you can search for classes to fit your needs, register, and even pay tuition all with the click of a button. But that's not all you can do within MyMU. MyMU also provides a list of key resources for students. Convenient and affordable, MU Online offers a variety of class choices to fit your needs. Access e-courses or supplemental materials from MU Online. MU Online also offers virtual classrooms where you can participate in class from any location with an internet connection. At Marshall University, we make information, resources, and service a priority. Through MyMU and MU Online, you have all the resources you need right at your fingertips. As you think about your future, who's your competition? Who are your chief competitors? I notice some of you looking to your right and left at your neighbors. You need to think bigger, much bigger. Choose Marshall University. Big enough to matter, small enough to care. Immerse yourself in your learning. Connect with your professors. And have fun learning. That's important too. Find your passion. Pursue your dreams. Marshall University.